Sean Kitchen, and welcome to our Out the Q Extra with Jamie Longazelle, Associate Professor of Political Science at John Jay College in New York City. Jamie is the author of Undocumented Fears, Immigration, and the Politics of Con- Divide and Conquer in Hazleton, Pennsylvania. And on today's program, we're going to be talking about former Hazleton Mayor and United States Senate candidate Lou Barletta. Uh, Jamie, thank you for uh, joining us today for our interview extra. Thank you for having me. Um, so we have Lou Barletta. He is running for Senate. Uh, he's congressman in my area. He is not my congressman. Scott Perry is. But, um, you know, for today's uh, extra, we want to talk about Lou Barletta and his use of um, going after undocumented immigrants uh, for his rise in politics over the past uh, 15, 20 years. But before we do that, I just want to give um, a quick of um, the Hazleton region and the, the racial dynamics, maybe going back into the you know, 1800s. Um, we met a couple years ago at a Put People First convention in Philadelphia. Uh, you gave a really nice talk about um, that region in general. And one of the things that we started off, uh, you started off your talk with was um, the Latimer Mine Massacre, uh, which anniversary was uh, yesterday on September 10th. Uh, so you just want to walk us through that process? Yeah, yeah. And, and it's important to, to start there because the... Um What's happened in Hazleton in recent years, and and what Lou Barletta has been doing in in uh, as a congressman is is in a lot of ways a, a repeat of of what happened in the past, and and so there there are lessons out there for us to learn and understand what what's going on. Uh, Hazleton is is part of the anthracite coal region in Pennsylvania, and and has this you know long and and rich history of uh, conflict between labor and capital in in the coal mining industry. And, you know, there's there's uh, strikes and, and turmoil and, and the list goes on. And, and yeah, the Latimer Massacre, the events, 1997, culmination of a, of a long strike brought about uh, the, the coal bosses wanted the miners to work more hours without extra pay for those hours. And, and they protested and, and the strike got, got very big, Up, upwards of 10,000 miners were participating in it. And they managed to shut all but one colliery down. And, and the final one was the the Latimer uh, colliery, and so they planned a march to to go to that that um, colliery and try to get those workers to come off the job too. And and the coal barons of the day um, recognized the threat of this, and and part of what they were so threatened by was this idea that that people had come together, that the uh, more settled English speaking immigrants and the more recent Slavic and Italian immigrant had sort of uh, set up past um, exclusionary stuff that was happening within the union and, and other things like that. And, and they came together in solidarity and, and were successfully uh, carrying out this strike. The, the coal barons um, leading up to the massacre had held a private meeting behind the scenes. And, and all we know about that meeting is that there were 300 Winchester rifles delivered to those offices and the coal barons hired um, I'm sorry, they, they reached out to the uh, deputy, or I'm sorry, to the um, the local sheriff who hired a, a posse of deputies, 90, 90 members of this posse. And it was there where they met the um, striking miners who were all unarmed and, and eventually opened fire on them, killing 19, injuring dozens. Uh, many had bullet holes uh, in their back because they were retreating. Uh, there were reports of, of ethnic slurs being shouted as as members of the posse kicked people while they were laying and, and bleeding, you know it's this this really remarkable story that that um, is filled with with ethnic animosity and 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 um, these divisions that happened um, and and you know it, it's tragic but it's also it's also powerful because it teaches us the importance of of coming together and and how how powerful we can be uh-huh. when we do and the um. So the the formation, um, so the, the this massacre ha- played an important role in for the formation of United Co- Mine Workers Association. Am I not uh, correct with that? It, this was a pivotal moment in that um, unions or that the formation of that union's history. Yeah, well, well, one of the things sort of carry you know, too when the Great Strike of 1902 happens, and and that becomes even just beyond the union, that becomes significant for the entire labor movement. That's when. You know the the president had to intervene, and and the Department of Labor was established, and those sorts of things. And so, so yeah, it was um it, it kind of uh, in the, the the way that the story gets told, we get the massacre, and then a couple of days after, 
Um, but but yeah, it's a much bigger picture in the the broader labor labor movement. And you know, Hazelton and the coal region specifically has this rich history of labor that um, I argue I, I think we've unfortunately uh, forgot. And and I don't know we the people have gathered the. Um, the folks who who wanted us to forget, who who have encouraged us to forget, who who taught us to um, point our fingers at at um, more recent immigrants rather than at the the forces that are actually keeping us down. Mm-hmm. And then um, I know going off to the 1950s and the 60s, uh, you I remember I recall you saying that um, Hazelton had this can do moment, and then up. Would you mind just touching upon that, jumping forward to that part of the history? Yeah, yeah. So so. You know, coal starts to go under in the early uh, 20th century, and then by 1950s, it was it was just about all the way down. In fact, there was a moment in the 50s where there was a flood, and and Hazelton's coal mining jobs got down to zero. Uh, unemployment was at like 25 percent, and so this group, this organization called Can Do, is formed mostly by local elites and business owners, but it, but it was a pretty grassroots kind of effort. Lots of people were involved in the fundraising campaigns and so on. And, and what they were able to do was raise $2 million, buy a whole bunch of land. Uh, that they used. And, and with that, Hazelton essentially switched over from, from a coal economy into a manufacturing economy, which, which lasts for, for several decades and, and which allows people, you know, I don't want to idealize it, but it allows people to live a relatively comfortable uh, lifestyle through the, the, the 60s, 70s, um, into the 80s. The 80s are, are a key moment, though, for Hazleton, as, as they are for many places. Once the Reagan administration comes in and, and starts cutting uh, funding for, for community development, groups like CANDU start to really struggle because they're not getting the, the, the help that they need from the government, and, and they they're end up competing with one another over trying to attract jobs into these, these areas. And, and so from that point forward, CANDU really starts to take a different approach that culminates in, in the late 90s with this um, Keystone Opportunity Zone initiative, which is a statewide thing um, that, that can do really relied on. Luzerne County and Hazleton actually had the most KOZ land of, of any county. And, and, and that's what Hazleton, once, once the KOZ initiative comes, and, and KOZ is, is there to um, provide companies who, do, who agree to open up on certain parcels of land that have dim, been deemed to be blighted, um, they, they get tax breaks for, for opening up on that land. In some cases, for up to a dozen years. In some cases, it's a full moratorium, zero taxes uh, for opening up shop on these, these parcels of land. So CanDo turns to this in the late 90s, and, and that flips Hazleton, um, its economy and its demographics um, in a big way. Mm-hmm. And then um, when does Lou Barletta f- start factoring this? When does he become mayor of Hazleton? Um, and when do we like, and how do these demographic uh, changes start to play out? Yeah, so so he, um, you know, these these demographics, it happens kind of slowly, and and I don't think a lot of people were were recognizing that KOZ was going to bring about the kind of changes that it did. Um, I think they should have. I, I think there was a lot of evidence out there that that um, uh, a meatpacking plant comes in. I, I think there there should have been expectation that, that things were going to change. Um, Lou Barletta, in fact, signed off on the KOZ initiative. He was he was in favor of that and gave Candu his blessing, which I think is is ironic given given what what happened and, and what he did. Um, you know, the change happens so so from about 2000 until 2006, the population change is, is dramatic. In in the at the 2000 census, Hazelton's population was 95 percent white, and then um, in 2006, the estimate were that was that about 36% of the city's population identified as Hispanic or Latino. And so you had this really quick shift and, and, and at the same time you had, you had increasing poverty, right? Like manufacturing jobs, Luzerne County lost more than half of its manufacturing jobs from 1980 until, until 2000. And so you have poverty coupled with uh, changing demographics, and and no one really had a great explanation for why this was going on because you didn't have a lot of the community leaders talking about these these economic issues. And so what Barletta does is he comes in 2006 uh, at the, at that point he's mayor, and he he starts to scapegoat immigrants and and he takes advantage of a homicide 
that is allegedly committed by two undocumented Latino men against a white Hazleton resident. These men were importantly never convicted of this crime. They were accused of it. They were the suspects, but the case was dropped due to lack of evidence. And so they were never formally convicted. Um, nevertheless, Barletta runs with this. He, he uses this to create a panic in Hazleton to, to create this image that undocumented immigrants are inherently crime prone, are running rampant through the city, are inherently uh, resource draining, are, are, are burdening Hazleton financially. Um, he uses this and, and it becomes this explanation uh, for why Hazleton is struggling. And, and you know, this is the, the essence of, of Trump's politics in a lot of ways too. It, it, it works because there, there is an element of truth in that people are struggling, people are living in these places that are going downhill economically. And, and so it's tapping into that fear, I think, but it's also tapping into to racial resentment and, and racism. And, and it's, it's, using, it's, it's taking those fears and giving them um, a different outlet in encouraging people to, to take their economic anxiety and, and, and use it toward blaming, blaming immigrants. And, and so that um, turns out to be wildly uh, uh, successful for Barletta. He gets the, he goes on to win re-election as mayor in the biggest landslide in, in city history. I like to reference that he won the Republican vote, vote by something like 90%, and then he won the Democratic primary as a write-in in his mayoral re-election. Um, he tried a couple of times and failed, but eventually unseats Paul Kanjorski to become the uh, representative, and, and now here he is running for Senate. And so so this, this anti-immigrant stance um, it propelled him, but but it left Hazleton struggling. It, it left uh, Hazleton divided. It left Hazleton with a lot of tension, a, a cloud that I think still hangs over the city more than a decade later. And it left Hazleton in debt. Um, there, there, there's a one point four million dollars in legal fees that the city of Hazleton is going to have to pay uh, to cover the cost of of the challenge of, of this this uh, illegal immigration relief act that he spearheaded in two thousand and six. Um, a law that goes on to be unconstitutional, but but nevertheless they they stuck to it, and now the the taxpayers of of, of Hazelton are going to have to have to foot that bill. <laughs> so um, here we are with uh, Congressman Barletta running for uh, the United States Senate in really a primary field that's sort of weak and benefits his um, be really benefits his run uh, with you know Representative Rick Saccone who is a Western Pennsylvania Democrat, sort of a backbencher, um, doesn't really do much out in the House. There's, then there's Jim Christiana, who's also, who wants to run. And he's really young. It's probably just to get his name out there for name rec recognition. I mean, this is really setting up Barletta for uh, a nomination and a run against Brady or Bob Casey here. But one of the things that um, the activists have been doing lately, there's a couple of things that they've been doing. One of them is to try to get him to uh, get off of or to remove himself from FAIR, um, which is a far right wing uh, immigration group. Um, what What is FAIR and what type of policies are, do they approach? I know like here in Pennsylvania, um, State Representative Daryl Metcalf has brought uh, people in from FAIR a number of times um, to work on the immigration laws that he has been working on and to stop the quote unquote illegal invasion of undocumented immigrants uh, into the state. Um, what are some of the uh, policies that FAIR um, has been championing? Yeah, you know, FAIR, FAIR is a really interesting organization because um, it's one of these groups, I think, that, that it really symbolizes the sort of shift we've seen in American politics it, where a lot of uh, groups that had previously been on the fringe uh, now find themselves in the mainstream. So, so FAIR, I, I don't know off the top of my head the, the year they were founded, but FAIR has been around for, for a few decades now. I think, um, oh, 1979 it is. Um, and and FAIR, FAIR is founded by, by a guy named John Tanton who, who came, came to found FAIR with, with an approach that, that I think you can only describe as, as eugenicist. Um, Tanton has, has been documented several times talking about things like population control, talking about who should be having children and who should not. Um, he, he was quoted specifically as saying, I've come to the point of view that for European American society and culture to persist, 
requires a European American majority and a clear one at that. Um, so, so this is Fair's origins. You know, they they've got this this uh, this eugenicist past. Uh, they 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 talk about undocumented immigration, but but they're really a group that that wants to limit immigration. Period. You know, something that looks more like the the Rays Act that that um, Trump was championing recently. Uh, something that looks much more like that, and and less like a. Uh, you know, some sort of deal brokered with with comprehensive immigration reform. So, so fair fair has these these radical roots, and and the Southern Poverty Law Center has identified them as a hate group, as a nativist extremist group. Um, fair, of course, denies that label and and does everything it can to to look legit, to look mainstream, and and it has been successful at that. Um, members of fair testify in front of Congress. They're writing op eds to papers. Um, they 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 sort of look acceptable but but underneath the surface there's all of this ugly stuff that that fair has done and almost, um i'm sorry yeah go ahead i know it almost uh it sounds like what you're describing is the modern um alt-right or the ma- modern white nationalist movie movement that we're seeing uh cropping up these days very much i mean so this is like the other people with ties to fair that that are are you know prominent at the moment uh kellyanne conway jeff sessions chris kobach who's doing this stuff with with voting um, these are the kind of folks that that have these ties. It's it's very much an alt right kind of group that that yes has um, has managed to kind of sneak its way into to the mainstream. And it turns out that the Lou Barletta sits on the national board of advisors for Fair. He is is essentially a member of the organization. He pres- provides advice to the organization. And so so um, Anthracite Unite uh, started this petition calling out um, Barletta on this and, and, and demanding that, that he resign from, from this position that, that, you know, on this premise that a congressman should not be serving in such a role. I mean, you know, and I think it, I think it makes sense. Um, it, I think it should make sense across the political spectrum in that, you know, we can have debates about, about, about immigration, but, but when a group has, has this kind of history, um, it shouldn't be okay for a politician to be, to be playing with them, right? To be playing ball with folks like this. It's it's just uh, it really sends a bad message, and and so um, it seems important. But but he's refused. He's refused to step down. And in fact, his counter to the petition was that he's he's proud to be involved with a group like Fair. I know. Um, I know. Before we were talking, uh, you know, talking about the alt right, and we were mentioning what happened in Charlottesville. Uh, last month, I think this was before he announced his run. Um, you said you wrote, you were telling me that you wrote an op-ed or a series of op-eds, uh, one with uh, Penn Live uh, or the Patriot News out here in central Pennsylvania about Lou Barletta's refusal um, to acknowledge what would happen, what happened in Charlottesville. I know it took him almost sort of days to even like put out a tweet or some sort of response on sh- social media. That's right. He he did respond immediately, but his tweet was, uh, or his social media response was about as vague, or, or possibly even vaguer than than he didn't touch. Uh, he didn't touch the racism. He didn't touch the bigotry that was displayed in those streets. He uh, in those streets of Charlottesville. He simply said, "My prayers are with the victims, their families, and the police and first responders who are working to keep the members of their community safe." So, so it's here, and it's it's with with fair too, where we can see that Barletta is really trying to, you know, in my opinion, in, insult the intelligence of of Pennsylvanians by by kind of trying to to create this base of people that aren't going to um, be thinking about about racism and, and and these sorts of things. Like he's not even willing to to touch it in a statement like that. Um, there was pressure. So yes, I wrote this op ed um, for Penn Live soon after it came out, and I, I'm aware of a lot. A lot of uh, were orchestrating um, call-in campaigns to, to try to get him to to say a bit more, and and it worked. He released a statement soon after that um, that that did uh, call out the, what he called racial supremacy. Um, the important point is of, of this statement, though, is is even still he played the the both sides kind of thing. He he catered to this notion of false equivalency, where where somehow. Um, Nazis are are morally equivalent to people who are fighting against Nazis. So he 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 talks about racial supremacy, leaving room for there to be, you know, uh, not only white supremacy, which is is problematic, and he he um, 
I believe called out uh, Antifa as, or, or another group like that, I'm not sure exactly which one it was, but he called out one of those groups in his, in his long list of, of sort of extreme groups like, like Nazis and KKK. And so, you know, he's still sort of not, not taking that moral stand that I think it's, it's so essential for politicians to take. And, and, you know, like if we look back on, on the history we just talked about, this makes sense, right? I mean, the 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 coal barons of from back in the day wanted to have and they wanted the the more established immigrants to be pointing their finger down at the more recent immigrants rather than coming together and fighting back uh in hazelton it, it worked for him rather than having people you know pushing back against against this corporate um welfare policy of koz or rather than having people demand better wages and better conditions in, in these warehouses and, and in this new meatpacking plant in Hazleton, rather than having people push back against that, he convinced them to 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 blame illegal immigrants for the problem, in, in his words, illegal immigrants. Um, and and so, you know, he saw that this worked and, and he's continuing to climb this ladder. And and frankly, uh, at this moment where this stuff is becoming more and more normalized, we're, we're seeing um, him do this. And, and, and I like to remind folks that, you know, while Trump uh, represents stalking, this is, this is an ideology that's been around, that, that has sort of been, been creeping up. And, and, you know, Lou Barlett is an example of someone who was doing this as far back as 2006. And, mm -hmm. and then, um, and then, so a couple of weeks ago, uh, President Trump uh, announced that he was going to be rescinding DACA, the DACA, Obama's uh, DACA plans. And, Moving on to our last topic with DACA, we, Pennsylvania make the road PA, which has been doing a lot of excellent organizing up here in um, throughout the state, especially in the Wilkes-Barre Scranton and <clears throat> the Wilkes-Barre Scranton, Allentown, Reading areas of this of the Lehigh Valley in the northeastern part of the state. Uh, they were really helpful in organizing um, people getting out to everyone's getting out to everyone, all, all the Congress, all the congressional offices in the state. And here in um, Carlisle, close to like 21, 22 people showed up in, um, showed up in Lou Barletta's office to uh, voice their concerns over this. Uh, his staff, I would have to say, was extremely courteous and professional in listening to all of the uh, people who showed up and allowed them to speak. But that really does, doesn't match what he, what Lou Barletta actually said on this topic. I know you were saying that he released a statement on um, DACA, on supporting Trump's uh, rescinding of the DACA decree. He did, yeah. And, and the statement is, um, I take issue with it in, in two respects. The first one is the, the simpler one, where he criticizes uh, DACA as a, as a policy um, by by claiming that President Obama illegally granted, I'm quoting here, claiming that President Obama, quote, illegally granted amnesty to hundreds of thousands of illegal immigrants. He improperly created more competition for American workers and legal immigrants. Irony in, in kind of talking about, pres in, kind of, in him talking about President Obama overstepping his bounds when, one, uh, Barletta was a supporter of Trump's Muslim ban, and two, when, when Barletta makes his, career off of usurping his power as a local mayor uh, or, or the city usurping its power to, to regulate immigration, right? That that law was found to be unconstitutional. And so he's done this in the past and, and yet um, is, is criticizing Obama for it, which, you know, if we think more about it, it's it's clearly a dog whistle here to, to say that Obama didn't have the power. But but if, if he or Trump does it, it's a different story. Um, so that's the first piece of it. But but what's even more disturbing, I think, is is that he pulled out some terms from uh, the, the 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 Southern strategy that Republicans started back um, at the the heels of the civil rights movement. He he talked about the the forgotten American worker. Uh, he called the 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 repeal of DACA a a victory. Uh, for the forgotten American worker uh, and the illegal immigrants who followed the rule of law to become part of our nation is is his quote. Um, you know, it, there, there's something to this too. I mean, he's again in part right about economic decline, about about um, American workers struggling. I mean, we know, for example, that that productivity in in the nation uh, continues to go up while wages are are stagnant. Right? There's there's real economic problems here. Um, and so he's right in that sense, and and he's tapping into something there. But again, he's he's blaming uh, he's blaming the wrong the wrong the wrong people for this. He's he's 
picking an inappropriate enemy. Um, he's saying that that it's the default of undocumented immigrants for undercutting wages, and and that's why the forgotten American worker is suffering. In reality, it's it's the opposite. If we were to protect uh, immigrants as workers, undocumented or not, we would have um, better working conditions for all of us. You you can't undercut undercut working people if all working people are being respected and and paid fairly and 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 um, protected on the job. And so you know he he's got this 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 narrative going that, that blame a, a vulnerable group people who are more marginalized and and those those who are are profiting from, from who are putting from not paying the working class as much as they they could or should and so yeah same same tactic again and and i think as he's campaigning for senate we're likely to see much more of this much more of him pointing his finger at um, at immigrants and 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 not touching some of this this ugly uh, racism that we're seeing and and trying to rile up the same base that that Trump managed to rile up and and I think he's counting on being able to do that to to win the Senate seat. Mm-hmm. And then um, one one last question for our interview: uh, Do you believe that the political landscape of Pennsylvania has changed uh, with the Trump's victory in the state and the reelection of Pat Toomey? Uh, do you think that the conservatives, this, this state's becoming more of a red state or uh, with this latest victory? Or do you think last year was maybe a blip on the radar? Um, I, I think it's still too hard to say. It, it does seem to be undergoing a shift, but um, I, I think we're going to know more about that in, in the next election or two. Uh, it, there still could be turnout issues there, right? There still could be it could still be a question of, of who came out to vote and who did and who was excited and who wasn't. Uh, but again, it, it, we'll see. And I, I think that that's this. So, so, you know, we have two people uh, identifying as political heavyweight that sort of represent um, both of the, the movements that are happening. And, and, well, maybe not the movements, but at least the party. Um, yeah, I think we're going to learn a lot more from this. I, I think uh, both sides are going to come out and, and really put a lot into this this race. And and I think we'll really see. I, I, I do think it's still too early to tell. And, and that's going to that that race is going to answer a lot of questions for us. All right. Uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, taking some time today and uh, talking about uh, Lou Barlett and the potential um, in the upcoming Senate race. Thank you having me. All right. And that's it for our Altic Extra with Jamie uh, Longazzo. And um, we'll talk to you next time. Thank you very much.